All right. So this is the seventh conscious interview. <laughs> I'm also quite getting quite uh, yeah quite a marathon. And uh, Thomas Andrilon told me actually, I don't know, how how come I can do this while I'm working also on the grant. Uh -oh, okay. But anyway, it's so fun to talk with you know you, uh, Melanie Bori. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. And um, yeah, that's why I can do this. Um, I want to hear basically, you know, your, you know, story okay. uh, for those people who are interested in consciousness and uh, your research work. Yeah, so maybe just a broad introduction of yourself. Um, so you have been, you know, so the most probably uh, influential work that you know has been impacting on the consciousness research you know you have done a lot you have done a lot with uh, steve laureus and so carl friston and julio tononi but you know one epoch making study that you were involved with was this you know uh, detection of consciousness in a potentially persistent vegetative patient um through you know uh, asking them to imagine walking and navigating and that was published in uh, science in 2006 right and uh, yeah, you have a lot of other stuff, but you know, that was probably, you know, uh, most exciting thing. Uh, still, you know, I, I use it, uh, that study as a entry point of the consciousness research or a lecture mm -hmm. for my class, you know, in the first week, actually, yeah. you know. Oh, thank because you. That, that, that's a most sort of, you know, relevant kind of issue for the consciousness study to anybody, right? Well, it's... Uh... Mm. To me, actually, I was so lucky to be able to start mm. my journey in like neuroscience mm. with mm. both uh, Stephen Norris and Pierre Maquet. Yeah, um, I uh, started to study coma. I wanted oh. to study dreams too, mm. and actually, so I was in the lab that was doing both mm. uh, dream studies and sleep studies, and also like coma at the same time, right? I see, and um, I think it, it, it was really lucky I started with actually oh. looking at coma oh. because then I quickly realized uh, in a way the problem of inferring the mm. presence of consciousness in someone else oh. uh, when the, you know you can't really have reports from them oh. so that like that and also the ethical importance of that question right, right. so uh, you know one of the implication of any kind of your size of consciousness or framework or theory of consciousness is also what kind of biomarker are you going to use clinically mm. to detect uh, covert consciousness mm. and in a way it's like, like by... so the covert consciousness is something that uh, people are experiencing there but that they can't express it overtly right so, the behavior. so for example during sleep or mm. dreaming mm. if we did define consciousness as subjective experience mm. There's something it feels like to be dreaming, right. which is like, also like to be awake, but right. there is a subjective experience mm. for a subject. And uh, basically, you know, it's a very important question to be able to kind of to, to detect the, the presence of subjective experience in someone who cannot respond. Mm. And I was actually underestimating myself. I wouldn't ex have expected oh, really? at that the, at we the would start have so much of that research. association in mm in patients uh, with brain damage. Mm. So sleep, yes. Okay, and okay. Uh, again, in sleep, we also underestimated it. Now we know mm. that during sleep, more than two thirds of the time, even during non-REM sleep, mm. you're dreaming mm. and while you're un unresponsive. But uh, behaviorally, we have a tendency to assume kind of naturally, if we know that we're of the, you know, the, mm. the, the recent science, mm. that someone who doesn't respond to you, it's, uh, and they are not paralyzed, yeah? mm. so they can move, but they don't respond to you. Mm most likely is because they're not conscious but mm. but so but 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 then adrian uh and steve were discussing about doing that project and trying to design a method to have a response to command by mm. by brain activation basically mm. And so I had the chance of going to work with Adrian at the end of my medical studies. So Adrian, by that Adrian Owen, Owen and also yeah. Stephen Laureus, and yes. who are also the you know the people you worked with for yes. this you know science paper. Right. Yeah. So like it's kind of a funny story. I went for, to work with Adrian at the end of my medical studies for oh. two months. Oh. I worked like day and night for two months with him oh. to kind of design some response to command by imaging that would work. Oh. And so we started to look at 
imagine uh, faces versus places, actually. Oh. That was the first simple contest to do. Right, right, right. And then faces, it was not so robust, but then places worked really well. We had like oh. that nice fairy book Campbell Jarvis and oh. everyone. And then we, we kind of analyzed this and then said, okay, maybe we need another one. Oh. <laughs> so then we did uh, moving versus uh, imagine moving and playing tennis was oh, because it's oh. complex but easy to imagine. So we had that whole discussion with Adrian. Right. And then and then the other one was uh, imagine singing. Oh. And then tennis worked really well and singing last. Mm. And at the end, we kind of went back at the end of the two months we had these are kind of cool, uh, you know, like two potential tasks. Mm. But I wanted to convince myself that they really worked. Mm -hmm. So then during the summer of that year, mm -hmm. we did a second experiment in the edge mm -hmm. where I was blinded of who was doing tennis or suspicion navigation. Mm -hmm. And then the, I analyzed the data after, then I'm blinded, and we could actually guess in everyone what was what. So mm -hmm. then we had like a good method to, in principle, detect, you know, response to command with neuroimaging. But when we did that, I'm like, yeah, it works. But mm -hmm. I'm not sure how many patients would actually benefit. Because I thought maybe we'll have that for locked-in syndrome, but mm. I I did not expect mm. that we would find sooner like soon after that the first patient doing it, which was the science paper, mm. and then after that replicating in a larger cohort like 19, 15 to twenty percent of vegetative state patients that we did right. that other group replicated this with fMRI with EEG. That's something I had not expected because we always assume right. you know so much that. You know, even if you so, so, you so, think you're a yeah. surgeon, you think it's more theoretical, right. but it's a very practical right, issue. Right, it's right. very ethical too. So uh, just issue. just to be probably clear. Uh, so the first patient, what well, you you reported could uh, imagine walking around versus uh, imagine playing tennis right. uh, for a sustained period of time, and then that was easy to decode in a sense uh, with the fMRI. Yes, because for some reason without any tasks, complicated uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah methods. Yeah, it was almost like a by eye, right? Yeah. And then, but. Uh, this uh, imagery turned out to be not super easy for everybody, I guess. Uh, so, so in controls, it's extremely robust. Okay. But in patients, I mean, if you do it yourself, mm. it's tough. You're yeah. asked to imagine playing tennis for 30 seconds, then right. stop for 30 seconds, and do it again yeah. like for 10 minutes. It's very attention demanding, right. which is also why we kind of did 30 seconds, because we thought if you have, and again, like there's just a command, mm. but then after that, it's just empty space. And if you don't respond to command, you don't see a difference. Right, right, and right. Adrian did also this test, like don't imagine playing tennis, you don't see it, no, mm. you know. So, so, but that's why we chose that kind of really strict criteria. Mm. But somehow in, in controls, if you do that in the scanner, mm. I mean, I've always seen a positive response in controls. Now in right, patients, right. if you have it, then you're pretty confident and it's right. like, you know, like location specific, like right. Brian Edler was showing, right. you're pretty confident you have a positive right, right 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 now there are many reasons why you would have a negative like right. a patient was retired or doesn't like you thought it was silly to ask yeah, that yeah, or whatever yeah, yeah. Yeah. but but then when you have a positive it's pretty striking you know like evidence yeah yeah yeah. like the one we had also like a, in the paper with martin monty in new england so that's the, the, the paper that i was going to yeah. kind of re referring so monty replicated uh tried to replicate that with many patients right right 90 patients you said they no, I was saying 90, 15 to, to 20 percent of patients in the vegetative state actually do it. Do and it, in, yeah. uh, so in, it's in, not everybody, yeah, but no, yeah. No. So when, once they can do it, it's very convincing evidence that they have consciousness. Right. Yeah. Okay. And especially like the patient we had with Martin, mm. uh, he was kind of in the air. We did that together, mm. and that patient really uh he came to us i was a neurology resident first residency there mm. uh and he was on the floor and he mm. could swallow some little weird thing but he wasn't digital he's saying mm. completely unresponsive mm. but i push him in the scanner first time and kind of looking at his bed you know like are you doing it or not mm. uh and he was just so clear the same evening i looked at the day was so clear response mm. that we just had martin come to to us and he, he came from cambridge and we we did the real time of him right then yeah Mm. So it was a like very, very clear, completely like unresponsive patient, except for we some weird behaviors like swallowing or something. Typically, they don't do so well. But mm. but that it, it is it can. So be I'm not really... a really doctor, so I I don't really yeah. understand or you know don't get the nuance of the, what the actual patients would look like. But the, so they don't swallow when you are. Well, typically, the food? if you put some food and things, they, oh. they, they would like swallow the wrong way or like there was a bit more coordination than normal, but nothing oh. in the classical vegetative sequence. Yeah. Yeah. So in the vegetative uh, patient case, uh, they don't react to anything? Or typically, it's just reflexive behaviors. Typically, they are fed 
you know, with the, you know. But some patient that Monty was uh, dealing with, kind of. That one patient I saw, there was just that, that little something that was not fitting was the mm. typical picture. I see. But it was not in a classical criteria. And what do you know? Mm. You know, I like, see that you're like, what is it? But oh. then he had such a, such a strong, powerful, very clear specific activation. Mm. So say cases like this, they can be very striking. Mm. And, and uh, you know, so they, they occur and it, it also fits now with the evidence from the TMSUG work from mm. Amsterdam, right? Mm -hmm. He also has in the, the vegetative state cohort, about 19% of them right. that have high, like high complexity, which yeah, so maybe is our best proxy for, for That for requires a little bit more of okay. the exploration, right? Yeah. yeah, okay. But anyway, so that, that kind of, you know, uh, patient study you've been doing and then uh, de detecting uh, consciousness in potentially uh, vegetative uh, patients. Uh, and then yes. you discriminate that to sort of minimally conscious patients. Yes. Right? And then that was when you are in, like starting your career and then move on to UCL to work with Carl Friston? That was our next yeah. step. Yeah, so like how I... Oh. How I during my PhD, oh. I tried to explore the potential of different techniques oh. Yeah? Oh. to discriminate patients in minimally conscious state or vegetative state, but also oh. to kind of have a feel on how these are good kind of measures for consciousness in other states. So I oh. did like anesthesia, oh. sleep studies, and I looked at fMRI, and I looked at EEG, I helped much a little bit the team EEG, and then I wanted to learn kind of be more autonomous with the methods mm. and do some dynamic modeling. So I went to, to Carl Fiston, again, yeah, like okay. studies comparing patients with different modalities. And also I wanted to hear from him about, I thought he had a lot of deep kind of thoughts about the brain. So I wanted to learn mm. from him in general too, mm. like from the theory side. Right. But anyway, so like my, my, my PhD has been an early postdoc has been exploring kind of the different markers we had for consciousness yeah? mm -hmm. and also looking with my own hands in a way to the data and mm -hmm. see what other people say mm -hmm. and going to find people with different tiers of consciousness and see what how they, they, fit, they fit the data together right and yeah and so basically it, it kind of culminated with going yeah. to london with carl but when i went to london i already knew i wanted to move to wisconsin because the, the reason why is because i thought well, yes, we have a progress, like we have this active paradigm, as we call them, response to command with neuroimaging in health already. Yeah. But what do you yeah. do with the 85, you know, 20% of patients who don't respond to command? Right, right. So I was trying to find some. So some you other already knew, knew that, that uh, at the time. Yeah, right? yeah. So I was still trying to find, because to me, it was very logical that mm. this is not going to be the most sensitive technique. So difficult mm. already for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was trying to find some ways from the other 80% plus, mm -hmm. yeah. To to kind of help to, to decide if someone was there or not. Mm. But but then if you don't have response to comment, if you don't have report, mm. you need to compare to other states. You need to have landmarks like right. to interpret brain activity. And so that's why I was kind of exploring the ground and then seeing where my hands went, what the results were, then going to find to me like the best way to be general to kind of integrate different conditions was to look at theories. So I kind of want to, to start and Victor Lame and the others and what do you think? What do you oh. think? And I was just I kind see, of exploring a little bit who was thinking what. And at the end, I thought that there was at least one uh, condition where I could find an exception to the rule for these theories there. Mm. But then there was still uh, integrated information theory that I just didn't understand. Oh. It was kind of a demon data. But I had no clue I see, about, that's interesting. about okay. like what he was saying. So I went to find Julio before I went to London and oh. I started to kind of talk with him oh, and just oh. think about it. And then at some point I thought, well, there's a lot of work to do on this, but looks like I mean, rather than reinventing the wheel, the intuitions at least, yeah, like just oh. kind of starting from phenomenology, right. then translate into the best, you know, kind of uh, physical measurement you can, but starting right. from phenomenology, then go to the brain was for me the way to go. Then I decided I would move ultimately there. But before moving there, I still wanted to do my homework about learning about the methods and the new imaging and all, and then also learning from Carl, not necessarily like consciousness theory, but Carl knows so much about brain and has thought so much about physiology and all this kind of you know feedback feed forward uh, is, is free and every principle i want to hear about that from him as well not that i understand this fully but i wanted to spend some time there as well and then keep the connection and, and but 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 then move on to that uh helping to push the predictions of the uh, integrated information uh, theory to be more precise and have developed some markers we can also apply then to Issues with disorders of consciousness. Right. Now the thing is, at, when I moved to Madison, maybe wait, wait, wait. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't good... work on coma at that point oh. because I thought 
well, what we really need to do is find some biomarkers that you validate in the other states. Mm. And if it works for when we have the report, yeah, when mm. we have a gold standard of subject can, that can tell you the word they are not, mm. then you can go back to coma with that. Okay. But that's where we are. Now. Okay. Yeah. So then around, I don't know, when, when did you move from UCL to Wisconsin? In so I went to UCL for a year, and then I went back to Liège for nine months. And I was uh, like teaching also the some people like uh -huh. from Stevens Group about what I I and then and then I moved in 2011 like towards the end. 2011 yeah. also okay. And then that's probably around the time that I met you for the first time. That's possible. Yeah. In uh, Francis Cook Creek uh, Memorial oh, yes. kind of thing, <laughs> yeah. right? Yes. We were all talk, we were supposed to talk about like 10 minutes, but everybody went over like 20 minutes and so on. Yes. And I was the only one who gave a talk in 10 minutes. I think. <laughs> Anyway, and then around you're a good person. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, around the same time, uh, also we met in uh, Mind Science Foundation. Right, that was a good one. Huh? Yeah, yeah, that was also, very yeah. small, like five people. It, it was a people. lot of good discussions. I loved it. And yeah, it in Maine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah, we wrote a so consensus review paper right. together in the frontiers, and then uh, around that time you moved to Madison, but also you started. Uh, residency training to become a neurologist in, in the US, United States. right? That's, yes. that's, I thought that the crazy because, you know, at the time you were already kind of established and also, you know, you, you would get, uh, you know, tenure position immediately, potentially, but uh, you chose to become a doctor, right? To remain a doctor. To remain a doctor. Because I did neurology in Belgium and I was finishing it. Mm. And then I wanted to move because to me, as you see, like integrated mm. formation theory, there are so many like mentions to it or so many things to discuss. I wanted right. to be at the source of the right, theory. Right. But then if I had to, one, abandon my clinical uh, practice and right. see patients, I would miss it a lot. And then second, I mean, really, I am uh, deeply convinced that you can learn so much from neurology or right. right, right, right. Kind of what we discussed also this morning right. about not only like the lesion studies that are very causal, but also, uh, you know, like, like for context of consciousness, like this agnosia, this weird kind of neglect or blind sign phenomena. I, again, I want to look at the, these data to myself. Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. want to, to kind of only have someone talking about it and I don't know what it is. I, I, I like to That's have me. my hands <laughs> have my hands in the data of different kind and do it. Like, right. And then being uh, remaining as a doctor, mm. I, I kind of still have that bond with the patients, which I really love to be able to listen to the patient and also mm. kind of help them mm. practically. Mm. But also I decided to do epilepsy there because I thought if I'm an epileptologist, I, I'm going to continue to look at these electrophysiological data mm. of patients with disorders of consciousness right. and or strokes. But also I can uh, enlarge the research agenda, especially also in Madison, using direct electrical stimulation uh, and then intracranial recording and single unit recordings so that we can have the different scales. That's also another thing we're trying to do. Like in Madison, they are like research in animals and in humans from single unit to the whole brain. Mm. And we really try to kind of piece every, every scale yeah. together when we can with the same paradigm so mm. we can to, uh, try to understand the best. Mm. Yeah. So, but that's one thing. So it, it, well, if you want to start mm. some clinical research program, or like we're also trying to do some research in stroke and agnosia, I think it's, it's really super interesting. And as agnosia also, like the fact that patients have, have a deficit, but they don't even understand really what it is, they don't even notice mm. uh, if it's complete enough that they have anything missing, mm. that kind of discordance. And these are very relevant for consciousness. I'm mm. convinced of this, mm. always been. That's why I did neurology the first time and the second time. But, uh, because how, people, how, how long did it take to get the certificate for the So the, the, the first time was seven years, but I did PhD at the same time. And then the second time was four years of neurology and one year of epilepsy, but I continued. First time you mean that uh, in the- In Liège. Yeah, in the Madison? In, in, in Madison, it was four years of neurology and one year of epilepsy. But I continued to do research at that point. We were also writing that uh, Nature Review Neuroscience with Julia. We were discussing a ton about also how to integrate kind of the global approach of, uh, you know, conscious versus unconscious and this kind of content specific approach, mm. including lesion mm. approach. Mm. So basically, I was meeting patients with kind of another view now because I, I kind of had a bit better idea, mm. at least for some hypothesis, yeah, mm. about, for example, agnosia and anosognosia being very re relevant for consciousness, mm. and maybe, you know, you can find some information about the substrate also from them, mm. yeah, mm. like a, as a complement to stimulation studies, to the neuroimaging, that that piece, 
it took time to integrate that kind of in my mind yeah like mm. because i had done mostly coma and a sleep before then we kind of moved on I, I had learned so much also from you know the great residency program where i was we had a ton of seminars and i was seeing patients myself again I, and i started to kind of so ask them like kind of how what, what they think is going on mm. you know what they notice or not and mm. kind of start to piece the picture all together mm. so it, it was absolutely a great investment for me not mm. only for what i'm able to do now mm. but also because i could see so many more stroke cases mm. also you know one of the things that happened and i i didn't even mention it today kind of yeah there were so many things to say but is that there is a miracle happening now in stroke medicine in stroke medicine mm. what you have is not only you can give thrombolysis to cure you know small clots mm. but you can also have surgery now where they remove the clot in the carotid artery or the basilar artery mm. and patients start to recover kind of back to normal mm. brains mm. Uh, in in situations where in my first neurology residency mm. that we, we we were just saying sorry but then it was more difficult to communicate with them now you have a situation where you have a normal brain you have a huge inactivation yeah of the brain that, that, by, that by and then what? by by anoxia but uh, then anoxia stop, allows, stopping the blood flow yeah when the, when the blood flow stops okay do you have focal you know hypoxia of a part of the brain but it's reversible uh, you remove the blood they won't go back to normal uh -huh. and you can ask them how, how did how did it feel like and mm. they remember and it's kind of really amazing you know kind of so I, do, I, I during that during this you know period of the i'll give you an example okay okay so I had to like. So wait, I I don't understand. So you you encountered a particular patient. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll give you an example. Okay, it's easier. So one patient with uh, Lockton syndrome. I could save a Lockton syndrome. Oh, okay. So, happy. so oh. the patient, and for him, it was amazing. Oh. Because I've seen seen so many before that oh. it just happened to them and you can do nothing. But that patient oh. somehow came to the emergency department very quickly. Oh. I was in the emergency department. He oh. came. It was like kind of even like a little screaming which is not typical of anything it was oh. screaming but kind of paralyzed and like it was just like unresponsive but oh. still like weird oh. we put him to this ct endogram we see a basic like how to remove the clot mm. the patient is back to normal that, an hour that, after. that's blocking the blood flow in the basal artery okay so Basically, after you removing that the brain becomes normal he, he comes right. from a corpse a normal gentleman was saying to me can i go home because i have my wedding anniversary in two weeks oh and really I said, wait a minute you know <laughs> But that, that patient, and I asked, do you remember what happened to you? And he said, yeah, oh. I remember I was in my chair and suddenly I couldn't move. And I heard myself like making some noises. I didn't know it was a stroke, but oh. he knew what was going on. Yeah? Oh. Uh, compared to another patient with a massive stroke, also went back to normal the next day, mm. where in the left carotid, and he had like uh, two thirds of his, his left brain that was uh, uh, inactivated. In oh. So he came in with paralysis on the one side oh. he was blind on the right side oh. uh, and he couldn't talk or understand language but oh. he was looking at me he was oh. not unconscious but oh. he was uh, pro profoundly altered yeah mm. we it was very clear symptom we removed the clock the surgery the neurosurgeons do and then the next day he's back to normal mm. and i went to ask him hey can i ask you like do you remember what happened can you describe to me how you felt and he said yeah let me think about it because it was really strange i have to think about it for a moment and mm. you come back okay mm. i come back and he said i said so did you think about it he said yeah you know it was really strange because mm. i was in the basement right and suddenly i i, I found i kind of fall on the floor i don't really know what happened but what i had you know i couldn't stand up mm. but i couldn't understand why i couldn't stand up because i was mm. feeling fine mm. i asked you know you were paralyzed on one side no mm. did you know you were blind on one side no Mm. Did you know you couldn't speak? No, I was feeling fine until my sister came in the room mm. and she looked so scared that she scared the hell out of me. Mm. That's like profound anosognosia. So you have cortical stroke with that, an awareness of the death. So I also know yeah, is that you know, the fact that the, they, uh, the patient themselves do not recognize that they have a deficit. Yeah, the nature of the deficit. So he knows mm. there's a problem, he can't stand up. Right, right. But he's unaware of the content that I'm missing. Right. And so these and like so many cases like this, like a nurse who had a vernicky aphasia mm. and she recovered the, the next day and she, she came in and she said, you know, I was at the table and then my friend starts to look at me weird. Mm. And I thought my friend had a problem. I just thought I was saying to her, 
that's fine i'll go home but she mm. dragged me in the emergency department mm. i thought she was crazy but she was my friend mm. that's what the patient told me the next day yeah? mm. but and then i didn't notice any problem at all until i started to recover mm. and then i started to notice i had trouble understanding mm. but when that happened mm. i had no clue mm. and not every stroke is like this because right. broca right. aphasia they know very well what they want to say and they know very well they can't say they can't get it out and right. it's so frustrated the locked-in right. patient right. knew he was paralyzed right but so it's very interesting for conscience to have this kind of new data too. Right. and that's something like kind of piecing the picture together mm. it takes a little time and also kind of you know like to see it yourself you, you mm. need to see it yourself to believe it right, right 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 so i thought you know as much as it took time mm. now i have a great i'm so grateful also like for, for the institutional support yeah but mm. i have um, 25% mm. clinical, mm. where I'm doing all relevant work. I'm looking at a lot of EEGs in encephalopathic patients, coma patients, yeah, and then seizures. I'm working on also lots of processes in seizures. And I do intracranial recordings. I started a single unit recording program. And then I can do that research, say, on agnosia as well. And so during my 75% time, uh, I have really quality time for research, but I can still see the patients in real. I love it. That's great. Yeah, seventy-five percent research. That's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, the, the, I I didn't mean to definitely you know criticize or anything no, about no, no, you know this you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that's yeah. a great explanation right and uh, as I mentioned uh, before we start this so some of the you know listener includes potentially like high school students and so on yeah. right so. I thought that you know your history or trajectory as a scientist and a medical you know practitioner is actually quite interesting because you know you have a very long shot kind of plan, long term plan to study consciousness in the end, mm. and for that you had this you know you you plan very articulated goal of you know spending further four years yes. in Madison and then I don't know if I were you I would probably you know escape from that you know, difficulty and then just come to come back to research quickly but then yeah. you pay you know planted so much the you know quality seed that you are now leaping the kind of the right so that was like right? an investment but then it investment, also yeah. opened a lot of possibilities yeah very strong prefrontal control <laughs> of yourself <laughs> Yeah, I think actually I'm just very convinced also about the value of neurology and oh. clinical studies. Oh. And that's also kind of, you know, like we wrote that uh, kind of little debate about the front versus the back of right, the brain, yeah, right, like with right. Hakuan and right. that paper integrating lesion and stimulation and mm. recording studies. Mm. I would have been unable to do this mm. like a few years ago mm. without spending that time I got more like in the, on, on, the, on the clinical. Mm. We call it like the battlefield of consciousness, which mm. sometimes around it is like really, it's like hardcore, yeah? Mm. You see all these kind of weird situations and also like the, with the motivation to have them. Mm. You learn a lot from it, but also potentially you can apply it to help patients in the future, you yeah? know? So I see that that's, you know, we, we kind of skipped up one side of your work, which is a PCI, but you know, because I had a long discussion with, you know, Marcello today, yeah. maybe we can skip, cut, cut that, but that, right. so, that's sort of your current kind of, you know, excitement of the research. And uh, you already kind of mentioned a little bit about the future direction where you are going to record uh, from epilepsy patients uh, yeah. for intractable with the drugs. Yes. Recording with uh, single units, yes. neuron, and also ecology. Yes. And you kind of uh, presented today a little bit of that. A little right? bit of that. So, that's more coming so there are like two for example for seizures mm. there are like two different very interesting aspects mm. one is this dissociation between consciousness and responsiveness mm. so you can dissect you know what makes that someone becomes unresponsive but still conscious during seizures versus lots of consciousness right, say. right so that's one very interesting aspect and like the hypothesis would be that as you see during sleep the frontal cortex may be more involved in responsiveness in the back of the brain more in consciousness we see preliminary data going that direction we don't know mm. another aspect i didn't mention though that i'm really serious about i think mm. is one of the most interesting aspects mm -hmm. is also looking at loss of consciousness during grandma seizures we have a paper that we submitted that's a one type of the seizure yeah it's where you have conversions and it's like the like grandma a, the, like the, the a, biggest uh, most severe loss of consciousness you can have I see. we have a paper that we submitted under revision so what, what, what are the sort of the uh, uh, sort of story about this grandma? Well, basically, oh. this is the case where you can really see that the, our data suggest confirm oh. kind of that idea that 
you can lose consciousness mm. not due to sleep like activity mm. but with a, an increase of activity like in widespread activity in the brain mm. so during grandma seizures before even they start conversing mm. most patients start to lose consciousness and there's a decrease in soul wave and an increase in gamma activity all over in the brain and Cathy Chevron can share data with three uterus from humans. And you also see there's an increase in firing rate going with that high gamma activity. Right. So, so that, that it's really mean, like a, a, a clear, clearer, because before I thought it was not so clear in the literature, clearer demonstration that indeed you can lose consciousness in humans. And the most severe loss of consciousness actually that you can have in seizures because it's a true full on responsiveness behaviorally compared to like complex partial seizures where are like staring episodes where it's more like minimal conscious state. So the deepest source of consciousness you can have in seizures looks like indeed it's a storm of activity everywhere in mm, the brain mm. and not that sleep like activity, mm. which I thought, and, and I want to push that further with like, for example, single unit recording. Oh, wait, wait, before going further. So that the reason probably why this is so interesting theoretically yes. is that most of the theories right. would never even imagine that the huge activation right. across the brain itself lose, uh, leads to the loss of consciousness. Right. But on the other hand, IAT actually had that kind of prediction from the beginning, right. in a sense, right? If it, everything becomes just active right. and similar, right. in a sense, then homogeneous activity should lead to loss right. of consciousness. Right. And you have some kind of a preliminary evidence. Yeah, and that. we're That's going great. to kind of dig further into this, but this is a clear demonstration. It's not the slow waves because mm. there's decrease of activity, mm. but it's increased high gamma specifically in temporal, parietal, and occipital regions. Oh, I see. The frontal cortex is one that generalized, but mm. in the back it is like mm. this. Mm. And with single re unit recordings, you can mm. push, push further now and look, especially because they don't even move yet. Mm. Yeah, this before they generalize. I want to look and kind of characterize better. Mm. Is there any difference in neuronal activity? Yeah, is it the activity per se or something mm. else? Kind mm. of push further in that. Mm. But this is a key condition, I think, for mechanism indeed, mm. because it's so different from the rest. Yeah. Mm. I mean, indeed, I see it's clearly since the start, if you look at the, even like the earlier paper says, mm -hmm. if you have the whole network is active, mm -hmm. then you have a loss of information because there could be so many causes for it. Mm -hmm. And then realm consciousness uh, vanishes. Yeah? Yeah. So, so that's another aspect where I think studying seizures is very important. And so mm -hmm. we're, we're working with like Hal Blumenfeld is also on the paper. We're working well, what, what? Hal Blumenfeld is ah, also on the paper. So we're working hand in hand on that. But I think that's also like a key, key clinical condi condition mm. where you can understand a lot about mechanisms. Right, 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 right. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah. And may, maybe, you know, uh, before uh, closing, so uh, we, we talked about your past and then current and the future. And then uh, before closing, uh, I, I actually interviewed with Lucia cool. on the first day, but uh, at that time I didn't have time to talk about that, you know, ad adversarial collaboration. Right. Thing. And um, you are deeply involved in that. Yes. Right. So, do you have any thing to say about uh, that, or you know, any any kind of associated, um, you know, initiative or the improvement of a science uh, that Lucia actually gave a really excellent, fantastic yes. talk, you know, um, yes. three days ago, two days ago. She's doing a phenomenal piece of work there, and it's yeah. kind of even beyond just contrasting theories. Mm like what they have uh, in that initiative that, that she's leading, which is the first uh, of the different adversarial collaborations by the Templeton, yeah? Right. So comparing uh, the predictions, kind of contradicting predictions of global workspace and uh, integrated information theory on the same data. Mm. Like she's pushing not only to kind of um, <laughs> managing to have the study starts behind and Julia Tsunami and all like the other players all yeah, working together, but also with like the rigor of open science, standardization of all the different methods, right. really like the, 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 the best rigor possible in how we plan the experiment, analyze the data, monitor data quality, everything that data sharing, everything right. pre-registered. Right. Right. It's a fun, just like, it's a huge amount of work. It's like incredible. Mm. And we collect data the same for the same experiments using MEG, using intracranial EG and fMRI. So it's also going to be a very rich data set where everybody can look. And now actually one of the experiments done in humans is going to also be uh, done in monkeys mm. and a and very mouse. similar one in mice. Right. So we'll have that huge multimodal and multi-species data yeah, set yeah, yeah. where we can not only look at the neural subject of consciousness, but also really understand the nature of the signals we're measuring, which I, I think is amazing. Mm. But it's a huge amount of work with a, a lot of like very brilliant students also involved and, and PIs. 
Do, do you think that kind of you know sort of open science tradition can be also imported or uh, exported into medical field uh, tradition? Because you know I you know I'm more currently working on the phenomenology side, right? Yeah. And uh, you know your description of the patients and so on, you know that's fantastic, right? Yeah. And uh, you know uh, part of the Joseph Parbizi's work uh, has um, so much, you know, impact yeah. in the sense that you know they, he actually recorded uh, videos of the patient, and then that comes with the, you know uh, actual paper, yeah. and then seeing what the patient actually said right. during this, you know, extra electrical stimulation. That's super. Right, you know, that's what I'm saying. That's like the right? data that we have clinically. It's right. like you see all these weird changes in confidence mm. that need to explain. Yeah, so I'm I'm thinking that you know maybe standardizing is uh, not that easy. Yeah. But before doing that, uh, at least you know sharing or you know. So there has been a, a, yeah. There has been so mm. like in the paper we are uh, trying to publish now. There's mm. like there was like 200 seizures, mm. and a big part of it was also coming from online databases I see. of intracranial EG. Mm. And then we kind of did kind of Does it come oh, with the uh, reports as well? No, so that's the thing. It's like oh. right now, you could imagine to anonymize everything and share the reports. Right. Uh, but not so many teams are actually collecting subjective experiences. Yeah, that's seizures. a problem. That's kind of what we do. Yeah, that's to, great. To differentiate between confidence and responsiveness, for right. example, you need both subjective report and behavior. Right. And Hal also wants to do the same thing. And we also right. said, we need bigger data sets about that. Exactly. Because it's very in, in, interesting. And, uh, you know, like at some point, the clinical definition of impaired consciousness during seizures was based on responsiveness. Mm. And now it's based on awareness, mm. like the subjective reports. But mm. I, the truth is we need co to combine both mm. and to have the, a clear picture. Sure, sure. So the intent with Hadwoman Flood is also to kind of do, like create a database of this. Yeah. And yeah. seizures are very rich because we talked about impaired consciousness, like yeah. the global approach. But there are also lots of different changes in phenomenology, yeah. like where patients stay aware, but they have this weird changes in experience. That, yeah. There's a lot to understand there. Yeah. But indeed, you know, like I'm all for it if you're interested in also some other um, clinicians or, you know, or researchers are interested to kind of contribute to yeah, this give a message, yeah. Yes, if you are <laughs> interested. Uh, it, it is also like for the stroke database, it's the same thing we discussed with Carl. Exactly, you know? yeah, yeah. All yeah. these agnosias at the end. It's like for neuroimaging also, like a team effort, you can pull a lot of data mm. together. Yes. The more you do and a lot of conditions exactly. together, the more you can understand. But uh, the problem I see so far in terms of the sharing of data yeah. in general is that uh, it lacks the phenomenology side, right? Right. So, you know, may, many people today, you know, towards the end of this, you know, summer school, which ended pretty much today. Yes. We talked about this, you know, um, various question about you know phenomenology first or uh, you know actions of iit and things like that and many physicists for example or many you know theoreticians in mathematics or some, some those people who probably would have been a very good collaborator for us doesn't come to this field partly because i think it's a lack of the data on the phenomenological side. And all they see or can access is almost like, you know, stars, cosmology, you know. you have Once you have the data to play with or um, sort of objectively share the kind of thing and description about things, then we can start to talk about things. But the, all the uh, summary of the, you know, patient's report yeah. or, you know, what you have direct access to, you know, as a sort of interaction with the patient yeah. is very confined to the small part of the neurologist and so on, right? right? I, I had some kind of uh, interaction with a patient without amygdala or a patient without, you know, copa sclerosa right. and also epilepsy patient, right. you know, by myself. Yeah. So that's really huge, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. First hand interaction. Right. But uh, it could have been made available if we have uh, all the recordings of the conversation or things like right, that. Also transcript. Transcript, yeah. yeah. But, you know, once it's going to, you know, like text, it becomes quite, you know, detached from the reality. It's yeah, very you difficult. Can still have yeah. a, like I say, dream reports, these yeah. are what you can still do about them. So yeah. what we're trying to do with the patients, for example, mm. we're kind of exploring for mm. these agnosias to combine some questionnaires about what they think is going on mm. you know, like like and like what they think is going like is wrong or not mm -hmm. yeah and, and then compared to what the families or the caregivers describe so that's the kind of just like on awareness of deficit right. and then and then also we're gonna try to sample 
spontaneous experiences, and then dreams, yeah? And then just subjective reports in general, to kind of to try to create a database like this and then pair it with neuroimaging. imaging. So like, you know, this kind of effort, just kind of like we're exploring the methods. Yeah. But at some point, if we have something that we're afraid, mm -hmm. then I'm going to kind of start to show them around to friends and say, can you like, you know, yeah. see if you're interested to work with us on this? Because I think this is, I mean, lesion studies are very close on that. And if we can push them, mm -hmm. not only looking at these patients with agnosia, imagery, like also like, you know, or dreams mm -hmm. or like, even like changes in spontaneous experiences, like driven by a movie or the cinema, like, you know, like things like this. Yeah. It could be a lot to do to kind of push much more in the, in the continuous angle. Right, yeah? right, right. Yeah. And thinking, uh, I don't know, because I don't work with this kind of stuff, but the augmented, augmented reality or virtual reality mm -hmm. to experience what it is like to be a, you know, particular type of a patient, right? I don't know, because see like, it depends because say, oh. if you have a lesion in the fusing phase area, mm. let's say imagine then that you, that would result in a complete prosopagnosia. So you don't know, you don't, you can't perceive faces anymore. Right. So imagine that. Mm. Well, typically patients won't be aware that something is wrong. Yeah. But if you don't see a face on the screen, you know you don't see a face. It's like yeah. it's a different thing. Yeah. Right? So it's a it's a it's a potential misleading. Yes. Yeah. I agree. But. Uh, and also, you know, I also have a problem with the, this, you know, color glass to mimic the experience of the colorblind people, right? Yes. I also think that you know, that's probably misleading. Yes. It's not really reflecting their experience, yes. but um, something like that, I, I'm not sure, you know, giving some kind of caution that yes. this is not how they would uh, experience, but, you know, it's kind of going close. I don't know. Well, you could collect phenomenology, you know, reports mm. from both that kind of experiences and right. to patients and yeah, they yeah, might yeah, understand yeah, something yeah, yeah, different. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. interesting, yeah. Just yeah, comparing the reports and then yeah, maybe it should be easy to actually distinguish. Right. Yeah. From the So research. like a, another type of agnosia that I think is, mm. is kind of very really interesting is that recent case series case series of patients with precuneous lesions. Oh. And they had different kind of deficits. Yeah, on one side only. Mm. But they were not unconscious, but one of them couldn't, at least transiently after stroke, recognize himself in the mirror, mm. or that they had a, a loss of sense of volition or changes in like body awareness or things like so, that. So, wait, wait, wait. Uh, like so, when they see the, their face on the mirror, then. He couldn't know if it was him or someone else, like for just transiently after stroke. That's really? pretty kind of self related, right? Yeah. So Even that, though they, they changed the angle of the mirror and so on? It was not really described. I want to do more with this kind of thing. Ah, that's what I'm saying. This is pretty interesting. interesting, right? So, but then you want to kind of see, is it only in one particular condition or not? Oh. You know, or, or like, uh, what about the dreams? What about, you know, like the spontaneous reports? Can you pick up mm. some kind of self-distinctions, mm. you know, mm. uh, changes? I think mm. there's a lot more to do about that. That's what I'm saying. But that mm. very interesting kind of different pieces of consciousness can be altered. Yeah. Yeah. In general, I also yeah. always think, you know, um, many of the theories of consciousness and IIT, I don't know whether this is true or not, but uh, assumes that, you know, consciousness of the normal human brain is the only target of the explananda, right? But uh, there are, you know, consciousness exists, those people who, for example, don't have even posterior cortex. To some extent, right? I mean, um, the lesion of this, well, you know, so, the blind side or something like yeah, that. Yeah, some part of the posterior cortex. Yeah, you can uh, lose it, and then you're still conscious, mm. but you will have some changes in the conscious, right? Right. And if it's so blind side, the I would say there's still a controversy, and you heard from Tia too, mm. because if you do scales that like perceptual awareness scales, mm. which is has been validated to capture changes in you know, experience, like subjects tell you, this is actually mm -hmm. reflecting changes in what I see, yeah? Mm -hmm. So the patients with blind side, if you use perceptual awareness scale, which is a continuous scale rather than binary reports, you get that actually, it looks like they have partial awareness of the stimulus. And right now, there could be existing some type, uh, one blind side where mm -hmm. there is a true dissociation, but mm -hmm. it remains to be shown because they, the three cases I know now, one was cited by Lucia, where you actually use the perceptive awareness scale. Mm. You find that they actually have some kind of experience. It's not mm. normal, mm. but 
but then so you wouldn't say that unconscious mm. as a state right they're mm. not in coma mm. and it might also be that they are partially aware of the stimulus mm. which is to me making potentially sense because mm. patients with blind side typically they know they have a visual deficit mm. while patients with complete cortical blindness or even a hemianopia on one side mm. they kind of cognitive low they know i mean except anton syndrome where you deny completely but they kind of know there's a problem but they don't feel this vision loss you mm. don't feel that mm. it's like what i was saying to you about prosopagnosia or like achromatopsia there are some cases suggesting that unlike peripheral deficits like if you become blind from the retina you mm. notice it directly mm. But in the cortex, the most severe deficit, at least in the posterior part of the brain, mm, of mm, what we could see, mm. in these agnosias, the, the more severe it is, the less you notice. Yeah? So all that to say, blind sight is a complicated story. And to me, if I had to piece everything together, it's likely these patients that partially recover from hemianopia, mm. they get some partial awareness, they can start to notice it, but it's not like full unconscious of the stimulus, uh, like full kind of blindness like you would have in the typical hemianopia cases. More mm. to be done, mm. but I'm just questioning. So do, do you have access to this type of a patient, like a blind side patient in Madison? I did not search explicitly for them, but I would bet you that if you look at these, we actually are looking at patients with uh, uh, cortical lesions in the occipital cortex right now for in the context of the grant we have with yeah, the, the Temple Zone yeah, for yeah, predictive yeah. coding. Right, 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 right. And we are going to test a, a series of them. And in my view, then part of them have blind sides, some mm. have more hemianopia. Typically, mm. patients don't recover much from hemianopia, but it's going to be very interesting to kind of confirm this in case series. But mm. I think it's an important uh, kind of warning that we need to kind of really look at these. Uh, uh, to me, perceptual awareness scale is the most direct assessment of, you know, subjective experience, but also that's the one yeah. that has been validated to capture gradations in the experience that the subjects yeah. say, yeah. yeah, actually, it corresponds to what I feel. Yeah. yeah? I mean, so. it's it's definitely much better version than you know yes no kind of experiment. But uh, I, I feel like you know we can do better. Yeah, like, it might that, not be the I'm optimal talk, one. But I talked about today, it's definitely right? uh, better not, than not today, not zero one. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely better. Yeah. And then more the the better one I I would imagine is that like you're going to the similarity rating yeah, yeah, yeah. or you know actual one. I prefer based like on also this kind well. of similarity rating across a lot of different stimuli. Yeah. To the seen non seen approach. But if you wanted to make a claim between consciousness and behavior, yeah, uh, I think still you need to be, be sure that, I mean, to at least make an effort that your scale that you're using captures, like it reflects changes in, in yeah. subjective experience yeah. the, the subject value with us. Right? Do, do you know any kind of a patient study uh, which used a similarity rating? No. Okay. That's uh, quite a, then not un but I think it would be uncharted and trajectory. Especially also say, imagine these precuneous lesions, or they might have actually mm. some kind of really high order changes on how the bind say the self to say, right, so, right. like you know, similar difference. Right, what right, we, right. That's one of the things actually in the in the future agenda mm. of integrated information theory. Mm. It's also going to be computational neurology and computational psychiatry to kind of look at these high order effects of focal lesions. Yeah, right, it's going right. to be interesting. So for us, you know, like there are different ingredients for experience that, you know, mesh together, but there's the distinctions and the relations, yeah, like face, nose, and then kind of how they bind together. And it's quite likely that actually focal lesions will have effect on both. Right. But how exactly to frame it, I don't know yet. Right. <laughs> but like one of the agenda is also to get clear on predictions on that side. And there, indeed, to look at these relational aspects like you're doing, it's going to be even more relevant. I don't know anyone who did that, but it's going to be cool. So many things to do. Yeah, but you know, more work, and then I think we're making good progress and try to figure out like the big picture all together, yeah. like including yeah. with your help. There's more work to do, but then you know, we have some more years left. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even okay, that's that's fine. I mean, uh, okay. Even if <laughs> I was gonna say, it. <laughs> say something, but uh, maybe next time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I mean, you, uh, it's also you know lower battery. I was a bit okay. you know concerned about this, so <laughs> right. okay. Uh, well, but anyway, um, that's a good uh, kind of end uh, story to end. You know, the future direction. Uh, there are lots of things to do, and uh, yeah, the, because you know the it's still like a beginning yes. of the thing, right? Like you know, we started talking about really like presence or absence of the things, but you know, consciousness is so much richer. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's so many things to explain. And also, yeah. like, 
piecing the clinical studies and also like the neuroimaging studies together, right. trying to test more uh, kind of theory driven predictions. Right. To me, one of the ultimate goal though, as I mentioned before, but mm. is go back to these patients with these sources of consciousness, try to find some better ways to detect consciousness from them, not like response to command. We, have, we also have PCI with some other kind of markers and also try to understand how we can help them. Yeah. So kind of ultimately, and the same for patients with epilepsy, I'm looking at seizures where you lose consciousness during seizures. The ultimate goal mm. is to help, you know, prevent that if we can, yeah. One, one thing I, that, that didn't come up at all in this in summer school, and I, I, I should have asked also Marjorie and other people, but uh, the PCI or any kind of measure of consciousness or a theory of consciousness of the congenitally blind people or yeah. congenitally deaf people or congenitally, you know, immobile people or uh, towards the end of the life, potentially, like, you know, Alzheimer's disease people. Yeah. Uh, these are kind of the view of the research into the future uh, i think uh, or do you have any people who are interested in this kind of research uh, because i have started collaborating with the cognitive development yeah. kind of you know researchers yeah. they almost like assume that uh, you know, we, what, all we can do for the baby is quite a behavioristic thing only yeah. right i mean it's very difficult as well yeah. but uh, i feel there are lots of ways to at least, you know, ask uh, ask things to children. Right. Even that is not done, you know. No. So, you yeah. know. I mean, if you have some kind of way to communicate with them, right? Then you could do some to some degree. Now, still, if you like really, really in infants or like this kind of uh, end stage Alzheimer, where like, they they are to, more like towards minimally conscious state. Then to me, it's more like again the same kind of influence. Like mm. you need to validate. I, to me, I'm still convinced. You know, like the best kind of the, the most comprehensive assessment of consciousness or subjectivity can be done in humans. Mm. And then monkeys, you can, but you can't do dreams. You can't do like you know all this kind of association. Mm. Like more spontaneous experiences are more difficult. Yeah? Mm. But you know, a, the, one of the things that uh, was very uh, striking this time was the funnies. Yeah. Uh, who, are, who are studying the monkey yeah. physiology, he showed that this, you know, no trained monkey experiment, right? right. With, a, you know, eye movement as a read out. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's kind of, you know, the direction that we want to go as well. Like, yeah, yeah. you know. And then you can do yeah, a lot of yeah, monkeys, yeah, but yeah, what yeah, I mean yeah, sure. is humans are a great source of data, yeah. but if you, they can communicate with you. Right. If not, then you kind of need to use Again, like the different scales, it's important to do mice, right. like what Christoph said, the different cell types and all that from right, right, right. Course, mi yeah. micro to macro. But then infer from where you have the best data, like about the presence of consciousness and the best priors to, like in the case of monkeys, for example, to these kind of babies or minimally conscious state or end stage Alzheimer, there you need to be really convinced of your markers to be working. PCI is, for example, one where we have a lot of confidence because we did like 108 <laughs> subjects and it worked every time, yeah? But like other markers like this can be really helpful to be developed. Yeah, yeah. And also kind of understanding why some patients recover, some don't, and all that, yeah. So, I mean, right now we're not working on babies, we're not working on Alzheimer's disease, uh, because again, like to validate the markers, there are some data that are kind of easier to interpret than others. Yeah, that's a probably future projects for this, you know, some of the audience. Yeah. Good, right. to, good, good place to end. <laughs> Is there anything that I should have asked and I forgot to ask? I don't think so, no. Okay. I mean, thank you for your time. And thank you for having me. And it was a pleasure to spend time with you here, too. We had All a great right. course, isn't it? Yeah. Like you guys should come next time. Yeah. <laughs> too many competitions. <laughs> All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you, thank you.